uh, Kent Lecture. Uh, today, I have the great pleasure of uh, introducing Professor Lev Khazanovich. Uh, Professor Khazanovich is a CE professor uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he received his PhD from our own University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, his research interests include modeling of payment systems, uh, payment performance modeling, and payment evaluation. Today, uh, he'll be giving us a talk about uh, the mechanistic empirical design of unbonded and concrete overlays. Uh, as usual, the presentation will be 40 minutes, followed by 20 minutes questions and answers. If you want to ask a question, you have two options. The first option is you can write your question in the chat, and I can ask it on your behalf. And the second is you can raise your hand and we can give you the floor to ask a question. Uh, without further, any further delays, uh, please welcome me in joining Professor Khazanovich. Well, thank you very much. Um, Isaac, let me share my screen. And <clears throat> can you see my screen now? Can you see my presentation? Okay, good. I well, can see it perfectly. Sorry? Yeah. Okay, well, once again, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to present at my <coughs> alma mater uh, about uh, like 30 years ago. I was like you, just a, a, a young fellow from uh, <coughs> from Russia who came to the University of Illinois, and at that time I, I knew nothing about payment engineering, and actually I thought that um, I might spend spend a half of my time on payment engineering, the rest of my in structures, because there is there are not too many problems in payment engineer, engineering. Concrete payments is a super simple structure, plate on Lincoln Foundation. You can't write a thesis on this simple structure. Well, uh, I end up to be finishing my thesis just on, on structural modeling of, of concrete payments. And 25 years passed by, and there are still quite a few problems in payment engineering. Uh, that keep uh, me busy, and I can tell you it's an exciting field. It's uh, it's um, it's a fast changing field. Many uh, <clears throat> many theories that were considered to be uh, completely valid are outdated today. So what I teach in my students now. It's only par partially remind, uh, reminds what I, I was taught 25 years ago. It's a great field. It's a great, it's a great area to make a career. Well, today I will talk about uh, mechanistic empirical design of unbounded concrete <laughs> overlays. First of all, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Professor Julia Van der Bush and Professor Sachs uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Well, this, is a, this was a long study. I started it when I was a professor at the University of Minnesota, and Julie was my sub at the University of Pittsburgh, but it just, it just happens that uh, several years later, I accepted the position at Pitt, and we finished this project together. Uh, before um, we'll talk about um, the details of, uh, of, <clears throat> of the unbounded uh, overlay design, I would like to just remind you um, what unbounded, unbounded overlays are all about. So basically, it's a type of rehabilitation of concrete payments. When we have uh, an existing payment, it might be in a very bad shape. Um, so it requires with the minimum pre-overlay in, in repair. And to rehabilitate it, we place an interlayer. And we place an overlay <coughs> on top of it. And the, um, <coughs> and the overlay usually is uh, slightly thinner than a new payments, typically between six or eight inches. But if you design for very heavy traffic load, it can be like uh, as thick as, as um, <coughs> 11, 12 inches. 
Um, why it's a very attractive type of rehabilitation? First of all, you completely utilize a structural um, capacity of the existing pavement, and that existing pavement provides you a smooth and stable construction platform. Um, um, so, um, of course, there is a problem in the raising grade, but if the, the, the grade is not a problem, usually unbounded overlays perform exceptionally well. What was um, commonly overlooked uh, in the past is, uh, uh, is the importance of the interlayer system. And there are several reasons why uh, interlay is, is a very important element of the system. It provides a slip um, plane. It, it provides a st stress absorption. So, and because of that, I never seen reflective cracking in unbanded concrete overlays. If you overlay um, concrete with asphalt, sooner or later, all cracks and joints from the uh, existing pavement will propagate through. And unbanded overlays because the interlay is less stiff than and the overlay on top of it. Reflective cracking is not a problem. Sometimes people claim that when they see cracking that they're reflective, but I never seen a solid proof uh, that it's the real cause of cracking is, uh, is a stress propagation and, and, stress and reflection of, of cracking from this existing payment, except if the base and subgrade are badly deteriorated, but that's a separate issue. On top of it, quite often <clears throat> the interlayer is used uh, to provide good drainage and improve uh, durability of the <clears throat> overlay. So in the past, uh, the, the interlayers uh, were made of, of asphalt and, and usually if the interlayer quality was high, performance of the unbanded overlay was high too. But um, recently, there is a new type of interlay was introduced, is a jet textile um, fabric, and there are many advantages in the system. It, um, they provide excellent drainage. They definitely provide a good separation uh, between uh, the layers. It's reflective cracking is um, not an issue. And unlike asphalt interlays, they don't um, erode. At least at this stage, there is no data that they would erode. This type of uh, interlayer was introduced in Germany, but for various purposes to separate the cement treated base from the new concrete pavements because they had durability issues in, in, in the concrete. Um, but in the United States, it was tried as a separation layer between all payment and um, overlay. And so far, those sections perform um, really well, although there is not enough long-term uh, performance data naturally. Those interlayers were introduced maybe like five years ago. Uh, in the past, uh, most design procedures um, for, uh, mostly common design procedure for unbounded overlays were in, empirical. There is a famous square root equation developed by the US Army Corps of Engineers and um, adopted by uh, the Ashton 93 design procedure. And, and well, I'm sure you, you covered it in, in your payment classes, but basically it, it designed the thickness of unbounded overlay as a square root of the thickness of a new payment that would be required if the existing payment is not there minus and the uh, square root of the old payment multiplied by a C factor that is uh, uh, that, that depends on the condition of the existing payment. So there are two problems for this equation. Number one, the interlay is completely ignored. And the second problem, it kind of assumes that you have more cracks in the uh, uh, existing payment, then you need a thicker overlay. And quite and an opposite, if you in if your existing payment is in a very good condition, you can get away with a very thin uh, overlay. And in my opinion, none of these assumptions is correct. Uh, 
There are several mechanistic empirical design procedures. Uh, Dr. Rollings developed a layered elastic analysis based design procedure that was used for the federal aviation administration for quite a, a long time. Um, uh, Dr. Tayabji and Nakamoto developed a um, procedure based on a finite element program JSLAB. Um, and, and it was used, it was promoted by the Portland Cement Association. But the most sophisticated design procedure so far is a mechanistic empirical design guide currently in the, implemented into payment to me Ashtaware software. So naturally the MEPDG has very, very many positive features. It's not just a thickness design procedure, it's a system design procedure and it accounts for the effect of many design parameters and side conditions on performance fund bundled overlays, but it does mean that this procedure is, is perfect. And there are several limitations of, that um, can be pointed out. First of all, it, it um, um, adopts the mechanistic empirical structural performance uh, pre prediction models for new concrete payments. So it's uh, in, when we were finishing NTHRP 137 A study at that time, we were running of time, running of money, and frankly, say running of energy. And uh, we had great plans for the unbanded overlay design procedure, but um, at that time, I was leaving an array for uh, the University of Minnesota. So basically, we, we were looking for kind of a placeholder that can be give, introduced with the minimum efforts, and that would kind of do the work. So in, in terms of structural model, uh, it treats the unbound overlay as a plate on a winter foundation. So basically the same Vestigard model that, that is used for design of new payments. How it's, how it's done, the overlay thickness interlayer and existing payment is are converted into a single equivalent slab and um, all the layers below the concrete payments are converted into the Winker Foundation and several other assumptions are made. So that, for example, joints in the existing payment match joints in the, in the <coughs> overlay, deflection basins of the existing payment are the same as existing payments and overlay. Naturally, if you have only one play to describe behavior of both layers, then the deflections must be the same. And um, and um, the way how existing concrete thickness, uh, sorry, existing payments account for it's it's also uh, its stiffness all is also reduced uh, by um, empirical parameter that depends on the um, payment condition. So to evaluate predictions of the unbounded overlay, let's consider um, a payment section located in Rochester. In Minnesota uh, will design it for 20 years. Uh, we assume a heavy traffic, about 8,000 heavy trucks per day. Um, we'll use typical action spe spectrum for an interstate highway system. And we assume that the thickness of the existing pavement is <coughs> eight inches. Interlay, the interlay thickness is one inch. Overlay joint space is 15 feet and it has concrete shoulder and normal concrete strength is 350 psi. If we run payment in me uh, with an overlay thickness of eight inches, uh, we'll predict that after 20 years, uh, about 27% of slabs will be cracked. It's more or less reasonable. If an increased thickness to 10 inches, then it will basically eliminate cracking. And that's what I would also consider as a reasonable effect. But if we reduce thickness of the overlay to six inches, then the cracking will be reduced as well. And that is not very intuitive, let's say the least. And that makes the design process, like finding an optimum thickness, quite difficult. And that's why. The payment in me is not very stable in the design mode if you try to run 
and banded <coughs> concrete overlay <coughs> option. So that's why in the, in the recent pool fund study, we decided to <coughs> we decided to develop a new design procedure that will be simpler than MEPDG, but will still um, adapt MEPDG framework. So we use incremental damage approach, we use actual spectrum for traffic characterization. We kind of use an EICM to characterize temperature curling in the slab, but we'll, we'll develop many simplifications. I'll introduce you, I'll, I'll introduce them, them later on. And as, as Pam and me, we developed cracking model and faulting model. Today, I won't, I won't have time to talk about the faulting model, um, but we, uh, we'll concentrate on cracking. And if you're interested in the faulting model, I'll be happy to provide this information later. Um, Uh, Lev, I think we lost your voice. We lost the sound. Professor Kasanovich, I think I think you're muted since like uh, thirty seconds ago. Okay, um, um, can I hear me now? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but sorry for sorry for this. Let me restart my PowerPoint. Oops. Can um, can I see my slides now? Yes, we can. Can you hear? Okay. The, um, the, um, did, did you lose me at, at this slide or before? The, the, could you hear me here? Yes, this one was perfect. The next okay. one, right when you turn to the next one, we lost you. Okay, good. So basically, in, in the, when, in, today we'll talk, I will concentrate on the Kraken model and the general design framework. So. The, the Kraken model has many features similar with the payment me Kraken model, but we introduced several significant modifications uh, almost in every aspect of the, of the analysis process. And on top of it, we expanded applicability of the, um, of the system. As you know, in the payment me the minimum thickness um, is six inches, uh, the mean thickness of the overlays, six in, in six inches and the minimum slab crack, sorry, slab width is 12 feet. Uh, we kept the minimum thickness to six inches for conventional width overlay, but we, we introduced um, an option to design short slab systems, uh, six feet by six feet. And in this case, the minimum thickness can be four inches. And there will be several other modifications. I'll introduce them later. Uh, so one of the important modification and simplification is in the climate analysis. So we didn't want to include EACM directly into our procedure. So instead we performed um, a large factorial of EACM runs for 59 locations for various overlay thickness from four to 10 inches. And those EACM runs predicted as temperature profiles in the overlays. Um, and as you know from your payment classes, the temperature distribution throughout the concrete slab thickness is nonlinear. So, so for every hour of the payment life, we approximated those profiles using quadratic distributions. And, and we created frequency of the coefficients of, of the distributions open for the entire payment life. Um, well, the, the, the constant term A doesn't cause any bending stresses, so it can be ignored. The linear term B would cause bending and curling, and the 
C term would, would affect mm, self-equilibrating stresses. So all of them are important. So, and that's why we tabulated and developed frequencies of those tables, or of those parameters. Here you see uh, frequency of the difference between the top and the bottom temperature of the overlay. And here's the frequencies of the C parameter. So basically we see that the difference of minus four degree minus four degree and C parameter 0 0.1 would occur about a half percent of the time. Uh, this, um, this type of characterization of the uh, temperature distribution um, for the payment system was actually proposed by Professor Rossler and at that time his graduate student, uh, now Professor Hiller. And, and when it was introduced, I was quite skeptical. I thought that um, it's too simplistic, but uh, well, it took me 10 years, but I ch now I changed my mind and I, I found that it's, it's actually uh, very, very efficient very, uh, and very robust at the same time. So naturally, it, the, 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 there was a lot of benefits to adopt it. Another very important departure from the payment to me was the introduction of the Tatsky model. Uh, the Tatsky model is actually treats the overlay and the existing payment as um, diff um, if two different slabs separated by a spring interlayer. And because of that, we, the deflection basins of the, of the interlayer and the slabs don't have to be the same. And the, the slab, the, 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 inter, the overlay can separate from, from the interlayer, from the existing slab. And on top of this, we account for some cautioning effect for compressibility of the interlayer. This, this model, um, Professor Ionis and I proposed for unbanded overlays, about like, well, give or take 30 years. It was a part of my PhD thesis. One of the problems with this model was there was no rational way to characterize this interlayer stiffness. We developed some theoretical guidelines, but we were not comfortable with this. And, uh, and, but, but since in this, there are so many advantages for the system, so let's see, when it accounts for composite behavior of the, of the overlay and the existing payment, but at the same time, it's, it allows for independent dip in, in behavior. It, it, it allows to mismatch joints in the overlay and existing payment. Um, um, we can in account for diff various interlayers type through Totsky's spring stiffness. And finally, we can account for the interlayer generation. I'll show you, you later how it was done. So we decided to develop rational gui guidelines for this um, uh, for the, this interlayer stiffness. And Professor uh, Van der Busch and her lab performed um, this laboratory test. So they, we cut beams um, from various existing existing payments, either the scheduled for rehabilitation or that already had an existing asphalt on top of it, and we we placed over we cast an over slab slab on top of it, and we cut a joint in the existing payment and perform the models of rupture test. And this information was used for two, two purposes. First of all, to prove that reflective cracking is not an issue if the, over, if the interlayers are adequate and that's what exactly observed. Professor Van der Bush could not break this beam um, because, uh, well, the capacity of the actuator was not enough or the, 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 the forces that she was the supply was much much greater than we would be we would expect to, to be required. So actually, to break this beam, she had to introduce a gap under the existing payment, and that would allow to uh, to break it. So basically, the system acts acted more like a, a sim simply supported beam than a, um, 
<coughs> multi-layered system. But another, uh, but in addition, we measured deflection, relative deflections of the overlay and the in interlayer, and we performed simulations of the system in um, using ISTAP 2000. And I forgot to say that uh, the Totsky model was uh, introduced my thesis, and that, at that time it was incorpor incorporated into ELIS lab, and later we included it into ICE lab. So this option was uh, was available for um, engineers for quite a while, but because of lack of characteristic for this interlayer, it was not widely used. So basically, we performed various simulations and we developed a relationship between um, relative displacement and the uh, interlayer stiffness. And after that, we um, compared with the, with the lab data and we yeah, there, there is a lot of spread of data, but we found that asphalt uh, interlayers um, had an average stiffness about 350 psi per inch, and fabric interlayers about 425 psi per inch. And, and later on, we uh, took the FWD data collected at mean road and, and we calculated values and it ended up to be very similar to our <coughs> lab measured values. That gave us, a, gave us a lot of confidence in, in, in these recommendations. So this, uh, the stress analysis, you know, we started uh, from the same model as uh, um, that used in, in, in payment to me. So, so when a heavy axial load is located at the slab edge between joints and during daytime conditions, then we will have high tensile stresses at the bottom of the overlay. And, and you can see structural models for single and tandem axial loading. And using a very similar approach to the um, payment to me, I'll show you a couple of slides later, we developed neural networks and you can see uh, the predictions are not, are not bad. So here we have a comparison of neural network stresses with ISLAB uh, calculated stresses. Also similar to the payment in me, we analyzed top-down cracking. So in this case, slab uh, axial loads located at the opposite uh, transfer joints of the <coughs> overlay and nighttime condition, top of the, of the overlay is in tension and those stresses were computed. But in addition, we also screened stresses on the top and the bottom surfaces of the uh, uh, <coughs> transfer joint. In addition, we decided to account for the duration of the interlayer. And that was simulated the, for the extreme case as a 24-inch um, long uh, length uh, wide void. So basically, as I'll show you later, it was modeled using uh, Totsky interlay with the st stiffness much lower than the stiffness of the um, <coughs> rest of the, uh, <coughs> of the system. And we developed um, neural networks for, in, for those systems. And that's it's basically a very similar approach to the payment to me. And finally, finally we, for short slabs, we also considered <coughs> axial loading at, uh, located between joints for, for data and curling, and um, <coughs> axial loading with, with, with one axial still placed at the transfer joints, and that is for both top down um, cracking and for joint deterioration. And, and and we developed another set, a set of neural networks for this situation. And again, uh, the correspondence is pretty good. Similar to the payment in me to develop these neural networks and to accommodate all ranges of input parameters, uh, we did not use a brute force approach, but we developed, uh, but we used the simil similarity concept. Let's say we adapted the similarity concept that says that two systems with quite different parameters, different thicknesses, different aggregate interlock um, 
stiffnesses, different curling uh, gradients, and so on, um, can be similar if certain non-dimensional quantities are the same. Some of them are kind of self-evident, like non-dimensional aggregate interlock stiffness, that's what you would expect. You would expect the quality of the um, ratio of relative stiffness. Probably the, the most non-trivial parameter is the Karenev non-dimensional temperature gradient. And that temperature gradient I found in, and first used for the, in the development of the mechanistic empirical design guide um, when we're looking for this type of non-dimensional um, parameters. Uh, it was given in, in a book by um, Russian engineer Karenev without any explanation as a self-evident quantity. Um, and it took us, took us a while to re-derive it and to confirm that, yes, it, it is a fundamental parameter. And we use it very extensively in the development of the uh, MAPDG, and it was very handy here. So, and, and here you see uh, um, the expression for non-dimensional temperature gradient. It combines the coefficient term expansion Poisson's ratio, radius of filter stiffness, uh, coefficient sub subrate reaction, in this case it's interlaced stiffness, thickness of the overlay, unit weight of the overlay, and finally linear temperature gradient through the overlay system. So se seven parameters are combined into one. And naturally what we need to, to add later self-equilibrating stresses. Well, there was another very important modification that we introduced is a um, so-called built-in curling. Um, in, the payment, in the payment to me, built-in curling is one parameter, but we felt that you can't um, characterize built-in curling with only one number because paving conditions vary during the day and, and ambient temperature varies during the day. So certain conditions will be more, more preferable for, preferable for, or the more dangerous for daytime curlings, certain conditions for nighttime curling. And of course, um, the entire shape will, uh, of the slab will, will depend on the stiffness of the support. So that's why we introduce um, two parameters. We propose to use two parameters, one for daytime curling, another for nighttime curling. And the difference between them will, will depend on the joint spacing and the uh, um, Radio of relative stiffness of the overlay and the existing payment. And the reliability analysis that we performed was a uh, Monte Carlo based simulation, partially because we didn't have enough performance data to develop MEPDG type reliability approach, and partially because we do feel it's more uh, robust and, and more accurate than, than what's there in, in, in payment to me, even for new payments. So, Unlike payment to me, we compute the damage not on, on the top and the bottom of the uh, overlay, but also the transfer joint and later combine them into one cracking parameter. So we use incremental damage approach and we adapted this um, payment to me equation. So this is a minus fatigue damage and here's a number of allowable load repetitions. So this equation came from payment to me and it's based on an um, early work of um, Professor Darter. But after that, when we compute, uh, in first damage is computed separately from all locations, and when vo um, void interlay is important, then we introduce, we combined these two extreme um, damage without void um, and, 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 and damage with voids. It's together, and this is interlay detection index. Currently, it depends on the interlay age and interlay property. For the future work, it should it should also so depend on the <clears throat> on the traffic volume. And after that, for each location, we compute percentage of cracked slabs. And after that, we combine them. And if you read um, documentation of payment to me, you you will see this type of equations there. So basically, what it says that the crack, one slab can can crack from top or from the bottom, but not. Uh, both at the same time, and it can crack in the transverse longitudinally, but we don't want to double count it. So basically, it's an addition of probabilities. Uh, and after that, we, we have one parameter, 
at the percentage of crack slabs, and that was calibrated using LTPP uh, perform, um, database GPS nine sections. And you, you can see the effect of sensitivity analysis, a couple uh, um, joint space, so effect of joint spacing. So naturally, if you reduce joint spacing to 12 feet, you substantially reduce percentage of crack slabs. If you, if you use dowels, then um, under certain conditions, the damage will be smaller because uh, you, you reduce damage at the, at the transfer of joints and, um, and that, that slows down the duration of the payment system. And finally, we developed um, a web-based uh, program. It's, it's uh, quite rudimentary, um, but well, we, it's simple to use for, for, for the practitioner. So you see a video. So if there are two types of analysis um, can be performed. If you don't perform reliability analysis, that the user should provide um, an overlay thickness and various parameters like location, um, traffic volume, joint spacing, <clears throat> concrete strength, um, shoulder type, interlayer type, certain interlay properties, performed analysis, and it, the program will predict percentage of cracked slabs and faulting at different level reliabilities and just gives you uh, traffic and easels just for general formation. But if the reliability analysis is selected, then in this case, the program will find the required overlay thickness to meet certain performance thresholds. Those, those threshold criteria can be changed. So there is a list of settings and uh, in, <clears throat> in calibration parameters, performance thresholds. If you change it, then in this case, rerun the program. Uh, since we, we, <clears throat> we require um, fewer crack slab at the end of design life, the required thickness is higher. So, and we performed uh, quite, um, quite comprehensive uh, sensitivity analysis when we run the program in design mode. Uh, naturally, I can show only a few slides. Naturally, if you have heavier traffic, then overlay thickness will be higher. If you introduce shoulder and introduce thicker dowels, then the required, required thickness will be somewhat reduced. And finally, uh, according to our model, if we use a fabric interlayer instead of an asphalt interlayer, especially for heavy traffic, uh, you might require somewhat uh, thinner overlay because deterioration of the um, fabric interlayer is, is less than um, asphalt interlayer, at least that's what our models show. Again, we don't have long-term performance data for the fabric interlayer, so it's only, uh, only in the future you will be able to confirm or reject the, this hypothesis, but that's what our current models show. So basically, um, I'm running out of time. So, so I'm, uh, before I conclude, I would like to, to tell that we, that although we made some improvements in design of unbounded overlay, but it's an extremely complicated task and it will require um, more than another research project to address all the issues. For example, we, uh, our interlake deterioration model is very simplistic. Uh, our, the way how we account for the effect of cracks and joints recent payment, basically we ignore them, but we could not prove um, mechanistically that they don't have any, any effect. So it's, um, currently we are working on the, and implement effective cohesive uh, fracture model. Hopefully after we, we introduce it in, into ISLAP type model, we should be able to analyze overlays in the say, more um, realistic manner. And there are many, many other improvements that needs to be uh, being made, but you have to um, stop somewhere. So we, we felt that this model introduces some improvements so we so i would encourage you to visit this website well currently it's stations here but 
uh, we're planning to move it to another place, but it will be here for quite a while. So um, I would en encourage you to twist it, to try it. And if, if you see any problems, please um, report it uh, to me. So we are committed to maintain and to improve the website and, and the procedure. Um, before I, I conclude, I would like to acknowledge many um, people who contributed to the study. My former postdoc at the University of Minnesota, um, uh, Dr. Derek Tompkins, uh, John DeSantis, who is now at the University of Illinois, but, at, uh, but his work uh, on this project while he was a, a PhD student at Pitt was is very important, especially for the faulty model development. There were many other University of Pittsburgh and University of Minnesota students who work on various parts of this project. I'd like to acknowledge Tom Burnham, who was a technical liaison from MINDAT on this project, and there were many uh, states who were sponsored this pool fund study. Uh, it looks like I am just on time. I will be happy to answer any questions any questions you might have thank you for your attention thank you so much professor for this very informative uh, presentation uh, we would like now to open the floor for questions so as uh, I, I just repeat so you have two options of asking question it's either you raise your hand and i can just give you the floor to ask the question or you can write it in the chat and i'll ask it on your behalf Uh, so we do have uh, one question now, Professor. So Egeman is asking about the neural network. How did you ensure that your model could generalize outside of your data set? Uh, well, we, okay, the approach we used is that we first um, designed the experiment. So basically we try to find the ranges of the parameters that we can expect. Uh, so, uh, so the, the ranges of overlay thicknesses, the ranges of uh, total skin interlayer, uh, like so on, and and after that we convert the this the system into a similar system, and uh, and in that similar system, the ranges are mm, extended in such way that that the ranges of those non-dimensional parameters are covered. So basically we we'll, we we'll never, uh, we we'll almost never uh, extrapolate we we'll, we'll, because neural networks are good in, for interpolation. They're not, they're not very good for extrapolation. So that, so if I remember for almost, there were only a few cases then, then we have to extrapolate in this case, we ensure stability. So we kind of bring, bring in engineering, engineering knowledge. But more, uh, but more, in, in like I believe ninety nine percent cases, we're t we're trying to interpolate. That's why. Um, but but to be able, able to do it, uh, we had to first re to reduce the number of input parameters. So and and we know and that's just if you go back to this equation. So, I'm sure if you can see if you can see the slide or not. So, <clears throat> can I see the slide? Yes, we can. With the equation, yeah. So basically, that's uh, that's uh, the key for success because we uh, we have like six or seven parameters uh, in for our neural network, and, and training of the system is a, is it kind of doable. Whereas in the in the original system, we had like twenty plus parameters. So in that case, yeah, you you will you will have to uh, ex extrapolate no matter what. So so that's um, so basically that's what my recommendation before is trying to train a neural network. Try to to use the like rigorous math to to reduce your system to make it more uh, more manageable. I'm not sure if I answered uh, this question uh, um, completely, but at least that was 
Yeah, we do have another question, Professor. Yeah. So Alam asking about what are the limitations for the use of such a rehabilitation technique. So she's giving an example that may overlay uh, are much thinner, which is like two inch thick. Uh, but here we're talking about eight to 10 inches. Uh, what about sidewalks, bridges, multi-level intersections? How yeah. much can we keep? Yeah, this is an excellent point. So this system is very, uh, um, I'll say very effective for the for rural environment where grade is not an issue. But uh, if you have clearances problems, if you have um, uh, infrastructure around it, say, is it well, sidewalks is one of the examples, then yes, you have to raise the entire grades. And that's why this type of systems are not very common for like <clears throat> urban environment. Well, it, well, it depends, but 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 basically, it it is not it's not the cheapest approach, but it's a long-lasting solution. So, the, um, um, and and unlike like two inches of asphalt overlay, it the, the design life on the like like several years. It can last 20, 30, 40 years without any problem. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Kamal, uh, you, you have a question you want to ask yes. it? Yes. So, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Kamal from uh, Ottawa, Canada. So, I have a, a very general question, a uh, little bit off from this topic about the concrete pavement, Professor Kajanovic. Uh, so, I just wanted to understand uh, about the general perspective on concrete pavement in terms of new design, new construction, as opposed to asphalt pavement. In specifically, I want to know how people are adopting concrete pavement compared to asphalt pavement in US context. If you can tell a little bit about the last 10 years or last five years, uh when they want to build new pavement i mean what are the main struggles still people people experience or feel that no let's do asphalt rather than the concrete so that kind of thing uh, if you can you know, from your experience if you can please convey some uh, some information on that well it's a great question it's a million dollar question but um in general, uh, it's great for the industry that we have um, two types of payments, so two industries, asphalt and concrete industries, and they compete and then try to improve uh, their products. Uh, and, um, um, and the stereotype is that um, concrete payments have uh, higher initial cost, but they last longer. Uh, asphalt payments. Um, uh, have low initial cost, but over the payment life, they must cost more because they don't last as long. Uh, but it's um, it's a very simplistic kind of, um, perception. There are many instances when a well-designed, well-constructed asphalt payment would last um, for quite a while. And and the, the, the were stations, especially during the last oil crisis, when the initial cost of concrete payments was lower than the initial cost of, uh, sorry, initial cost of the concrete payment was lower than the initial cost of, um, of the asset payments. But the bottom line is, it's a, uh, these are two different products that are, um, like when, for concrete payments, the mixed design is important, but not as important as for asset payments. But on the other hand, the structure of design is very important. Joint spacing, selection of dowel diameter, shoulder types, use of widen lane, and so on. Um, but, but generally, there is a, the industry is compete, and uh, and that that good for research is good for engineers because if you have only one solution, then a technician can design a payment. If you have Two, in the, uh, two competing industries that where you need engineers that who are able to to find the best solution. 
Thank so, you, Professor. So it's sorry, Isaac. Yeah, yeah we have like very uh, we are uh, restricted on time, and we have many questions. So I I would like to take the pro, the question of Professor Eisler. Kamal, if we have time, we'll go back to your question. No problem. I I think Professor Kajar we covered everything. I had just a clarification thing, but yeah, I'll leave it now. Yeah. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Got a couple questions for you. Um, first, you, uh, how valid is the Totsky model? I, I assume you're you're assuming all the the inner layers boils down to a compressible spring without any friction. Yes, it's correct, and we struggled with that, but we decided that at this stage we uh, we can't. Um, we didn't have resources to introduce something more sophisticated. And actually, we are working on a new version of the finite area program, and hopefully, there we will we will also introduce friction in addition to to um, compression. But on the other hand, for for uh, the fabric interlay, actually, it's it's valid because there is, there is very little friction there. For asphalt, it's it's a little bit conservative. I agree with you, but again, that's the, the current model assumes that accounts only for compression and not and not for friction, which is better than uh, uh, Ilya Slav than uh, will, will will completely ignore it. Yeah, uh, what do you? I didn't see. I don't think I saw any plots of when the slab panels were less around six feet. I don't recall. Uh, maybe I. No, there was just. At any rate, um, the the thick the failure criteria that dominates once you get to six by six panels. I'm curious about that. Uh, well, I have to double check it. We 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 output it in one of the hidden files, but 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 we do not reported to the users because and it was pure programming issue because we were again at the end of the project we wanted to finish that website it's uh, all the information is there it's re it's reported in the in the temporary files but, so I, okay. I have to take a look i i i, I can't say at the top of from the top of my head what's more dangerous okay but i guess my I, one last uh, question or point that maybe you can think about. Um, we have this section over in near Springfield that has one direction with an asphalt interlayer and one direction with the fabric with six by six panels unbonded on top of an old concrete. And uh, during a survey this summer, we noticed the fabric, The it seemed like the lane had settled maybe a quarter inch. Uh, but no cracking. On the other side with the asphalt inner layer, we actually saw some longitudinal cracking beginning. Yeah, uh, and this was after about five years. So I'm curious if uh, this seems odd or what you would expect. Well, well, that's exactly what I would expect. Well, well not necessarily longitudinal cracking in the asphalt. Um, but I have to check because it's, uh, I w it's interesting to run this for the program and and to see what um, what the new program would uh, would produce, but uh, but the settlement, yes, that I would expect because when we uh, performed the uh, testing of the fabric interlay at Minyalf, we had a significant settlement of the of the interlay, especially if you if you use a thick interlay. Uh, so. I, most, um, what was the, what was the thickness of the interlay at, at, at that uh, at, at that section for the fabric? Yeah, I, I think it was maybe four or five millimeters. Well, so in, the, so in, so in this case, well, I don't see how it will, uh, how it will settle a quarter yeah. of the inch. But, yeah. But, anyway, but, that, I, I'm just curious. Yeah, but but it could it, it could compress quite a bit. So basically, in this case, one eighth of an inch. Yeah, it's it's clear. So basically, it would it would compress at least at least. Uh, it, it, at least uh, the thickness would be reduced twice. So that's that's what 
the object more is more or less heavier. Okay. But, but on, on the other hand, even after even after the settlement, it should provide pretty good separation, and it could and the drainage still should be uh, pretty good. Okay, thanks. I'll let somebody else ask a question. Uh, so we do have a question from Joao. Uh, he's asking uh, two quick questions. One of them is: Is it also interesting to overlay old pavement to overlay old asphalt concrete pavement regarding the interlay to include more interlayer specific parameter? Wouldn't change the solution. Well, uh, Frank said, I don't see a huge reason to put an interlay in between the old asphalt pavement and, and the concrete um, um, pavement because uh, in this case, if the, unless for unless the stiffness of the of the asphalt is exceptionally high, and there is kind of for, uh, then then it should be much lower than the stiffness of the concrete layer, and and there is there is no reason to believe that the, any distresses from from asphalt would propagate um, into the concrete layer. The only reason why we want to have it if there, is, there are significant significant rats, but in, in this case, I will rather just mill off and, and make a flat surface prior to placing in, in interlayer. And it's also important to fix any path holes in terms of you shouldn't have any voids in the, in the basin to subgrade. But other than that, but other than that I don't see any reason why you want you you would like to separate your your concrete from uh, <clears throat> old asphalt. That's uh, professor. Yeah, I that's have a quick question. question. Yeah. Yeah, I do have, have a small yeah. question. So you were mentioning that you are planning to incorporate a fracture model for the overlay. Yeah. Uh, can you please elaborate more on this fracture model? Uh, what is the basis of this model? Well, actually, this is a model. Um, and we have actually two, uh, well, okay, just uh, and we are working on actually two models at the same time. One is a conventional uh, bilinear in a, in a, in a model, like used by Bajant and, and, and Shah, but there is various formulations. And another is the model developed by uh, Professor um, Paulini and uh, uh, Professor uh, Rosler, uh, and, and the second model can can also account for the mixed mode uh, and fracture. So, but the um, the idea is to uh, to to get the best from both worlds. So it, it will model um, a, a concrete layer near the crack using using. Uh, 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 three-dimensional <laughs> elements. Well, currently we're, we're still working on a two-dimensional formulation, but the next step will be three-dimensional, basically brick elements. But away from the crack, uh, using uh, uh, plate elements. So in this case, the program will be efficient and at, at one time, but but uh, but very accurate, close to the joint. And another uh, issue that we found by working on this model is that there will be a huge advantage compared to abacus because abacus has uh, like uh, tangential solver which is good for like, plasticity and like and other types of non-linearities but when you have um, a decrease in stiffness so basically your tangent uh, tangential stiffness is negative as it happens in uh, in, in, in a cohesive fracture then in this case, the model becomes very unstable. And uh, well, there are some like, more sophisticated solvers implementing Abacus that makes it a little bit more stable, but still it's a very, a very uh, involved task. Uh, the results are can very unreliable because Abacus is a general purpose program, so they can't be created for every, every small item. They're great in general, but but for this particular cases, when you have long payment system and a crack constraint at one place, uh, in, 
a simple sequence, uh, sequence solver that is currently implemented in, in the ice lab in, would be much more efficient and much more stable and much better. And uh, uh, your in, in, in <coughs> your former colleague, Dr. Tere Shushaban Sen, uh, who's, who's currently as a postdoc at, at Pitt, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's working in this, in this direction and he made very significant progress. So I, I don't have a, a date when we, when we release this program, it might take a while, but we hope that um, this and many other improvements will, um, will make the new tool quite attractive, attractive alternative, not just to an ice lab, but to Abacus as well, but for, for concrete payment for me, naturally. Thank you so much, Professor. I'm still receiving yeah. questions, but I, we cannot, the time is up. Sure. Thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Yeah. We learned a lot from it, and yeah. thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you for your, um, for your attention. You can email me on those questions. I'll, uh, I'll be happy to contact the students and discuss them with them. Uh, sure, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks, nice. Lev, and it's good seeing you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Bye.